Welcome to Cause. We're uh, very pleased to be offering the venue for um, this discussion around SEP 65. Um, we're very, very pleased indeed to be able to uh, share the podium tonight um, with JBA and uh, Marquisi Partners. We're um, uh, inviting you all to participate in what we hope will be a very interact interactive um, discussion. We're a nice small group and uh, let's see if we can um, make the most of um, the small room and the opportunity to interact. So um, I invite you to uh, interject, to comment and ask questions from time to time as ever you wish. Um, we're going to do a, a, a short presentation each, um, starting with uh, JBA when um, Tom Gord and Alexis Chella will uh, talk to us about SEP65. It's Genesis um, and the um, amendments that are proposed by the state government at the present time. Um, and then I'll invite Eugene to uh, speak to us about some of the practical aspects of giving effect to SEP 65 and his experience over the years. Um, and we might have a talk about how some of the proposed amendments might impact on that. And then I'm hoping that I won't bore you all senseless um, with uh, just a bit of an update on um, some recent cases uh, in the Land and Environment Court and the way in which the court has applied SEP 65 um, over the last uh, couple of years. Um, so I'm going to invite um, Tom and Alexis uh, to kick off. Uh, my name's uh, Tom Good and I'm a director of JBA and um, as Christine pointed out we've been filmed today so no, no heckling from the, the back stalls. Um, so I'm going to probably talk more about the, I suppose, the, the, the drier part of the, the two parts of the SEP amendment, which is the, the policy itself. And Alexis will uh, talk about the design guide, which is probably more around where the teeth are uh, sinking into and where it really affects where the rubber hits the road. Okay, so um, I think it's now almost sort of modern day planning folklore anyway, that um, the, the SEP 65 came into force with, with Bob Carr driving from his home in Maroubra to the office in Macquarie Street and was uh, walking past, or well, drove past Kingsford and saw some, some sort of poorly designed walk up flats in Kingsford and um, set his task to, uh, I suppose, reform Sydney's built um, environment. And in terms of, I suppose, the glacial movement of planning reform, it was only two years later that SEP 65 was introduced. Uh, and that elevated um, design as a key measure for the planning system of New South Wales. Uh, the state policy uh, identified 10 key design principles ranging from scale and built form through to housing affordability. Um, the SEP introduced the residential flat design code which was more about the how-to guide and how to achieve these principles and despite that being a guide I think we've seen as, in terms of practitioners that this guide is now um, putting up rules of thumb that are being rules per se and rigid rules that are being applied by councils. Um, so after 12 years of, of I think um, indisputably raising the average design quality in Sydney the government has embarked on a review of this key design policy. So I'll just talk about some of those the key amendments in terms of the SEP which is the, uh, the guiding legislation. Um, so the first key amendment probably makes good on, on some practice that was being applied um, at the coalface by councils and that was including shop top and mixed use developments uh, in, the, in, the, in its application. Um, probably not unreasonable to consider that any of these inhabitable, uh, inhabitable spaces you know, should consider some of these um, rules of thumb just so long as that, uh, that the nuances of each development type and its context are considered in its application. Now the new um, the new SEP is proposing provisions that um, really take the government's stance on, on DCPs and their application a little further. Uh, and in this instance, it's clarifying that a DCP cannot place more onerous controls uh, on a number of key standards, such as you know, daylight and natural ventilation, than the, uh, than the, um, the guide itself. The last one, uh, or the last couple of key changes I think to the SEP are the, the role of panels which has been a, a good initiative I think in terms of the SEP although sadly it's uh, proposing amendments to exclude planners from representation on panels and um, it is seeking to strengthen the role and the makeup and the rigour of these panels and their processes. Um, finally the key tenant of the SEP which is these ten design principles are being reduced down to nine and it's through an, an amalgamation from of built form and scale into a single 
a single uh, principle for reasons unbeknown to me or and to anyone I've spoken to. Um, so look, I'll pass on to Alexi to talk through the design guide and probably some of the nitty gritty aspects of it. Thank you, Tom. Um, I suppose just a bit of background, the department uh, commenced the review of the set back in 2008. Um, so I've been growing my beard since then. Um, <laughs> no, just jokes. Um, but it's obviously taken quite a while to get to, to where we are when, and we've got a document that um, look, is a bit fatter and you can tell by my copy it's, I've gone through it in quite a bit of detail. But um, so they've obviously spent a lot of the focus in that review since 2008 on, on the detail. Um, so fundamentally the biggest shift um, in going from the RFTC to the ADG um, is this emphasis on, on performance based um, outcomes. Um, it's a philosophy and approach adopted in Queensland um, and something that through the planning reforms they were trying to implement um, but obviously there's been some, some stalls in that regard but um, in a nutshell it's, it's trying to move away from you know as Tom mentioned the rules of thumb it's trying to emphasize that there are these outcomes some objectives um, and there's certain ways that you can achieve that objective. Um, so I suppose yeah, fundamentally that, that's one of the biggest changes that obviously you know, is emphasised in the, in the title. It is trying to be a guide. Um, so for the day-to-day, -day, um, you know, there are two, two key parts of, of the guideline that um, you'll probably come in, in, in uh, interaction with is part three and part four. Um, so both part three and part four, you know, identify a number of topics. Um, and then each of those topics, for, for example, um, solar access, um, building separation, etc., um, has you know, a range of performance criteria. Um, and then there are some acceptable solutions, and in some instance, some alternative um, solutions, and how you achieve that that outcome. Um, I've just got an example here of uh, solar access, so you can click. Uh, you can see the, the performance criteria um, that they've got to cover off on this on this topic. Um, so you know it's obviously not prescriptive and you know quite um, you know quite reasonable and you know quite effective outcomes that they're, they're trying to promote. Um, a lot of the acceptable solutions um, aren't new, um, which is a, I suppose a good good and a bad thing. Obviously, with, with solar access, it's, it's carrying forward um, some existing principles. Just some anecdotally. Um, we've been involved with the PCA and the Department of Planning um, over the exhibition period um, and there's been some feedback that uh, they may look at either side of um, June 21. So we originally put forward perhaps extending, you know, looking from 8am to 4pm for example, uh, but the, the indicator that they might look maybe six weeks either side just to um, you know, open up that, you know, this focus on one day you know, across the whole year, um, which I think which I think is a, a good outcome if, if we can try and secure that. Um, I just thought it'd be useful to pick up on this. Obviously, it's that's, that's a snippet from uh, Daily Telly of uh, the Hillshire, you know, throwing their arms up about some of the changes. But um, you know, one of the big ones is about um, car parking. Obviously, there's a you know trying to reduce car dependency, um, so that they're, they're trying to set you know that there's no minimum requirements where you're near a rail station. Or a light rail station. Um, that's it, that's in metropolitan Sydney areas. Um, there's also a suggestion, perhaps, that that should be expanded to um, to bus interchanges as well. Um, and then further out, in terms of um, you know reducing the rate set by DCPs for um, RMS guide to traffic and, and parking development. Um, from, from our take on things, and we've put this forward in our formal submission, there's, there's kind of eight key um, aspects to the apartment design guideline that we have some concerns with. Um, firstly, it's, it's application um, by consent authorities. Obviously, we've had you know, 10 plus years of councils applying rules of thumb, you know, probably incorrectly. So, you know, the challenges in terms of, you know, getting them to now flip, flip um, application in terms of you know actually looking at what the objective is of these of these controls, um, so I feel you know education will be quite important um, from that perspective. Uh, secondly, um, our experience uh, with consent authorities that they're applying the SEP and the RFTC and, and most likely ADG um, 
to uh, uh, affordable housing, um, student accommodation, um, those types of things. Where obviously that's that's not the intent. Um, the department's been pretty clear about you know that is not what the SEP is meant to apply to. Um, and sorry, also service departments. Um, it's another another housing type that councils um, are applying the SEP to. Um, fourth, uh, yeah, obviously thirdly. Um, there's still this focus on numeric controls. Um, we feel that you know there needs to be some broader recognition about amenity in its holistic um, context. Um, solar and natural ventilation are great and important, but they're not the key and only aspect of amenity. Uh, fourth, affordability, just whether or not you know these changes and some are good, some are just carrying forward the same um, same mantra, just whether or not they're actually stepping up to you know one of the key aspects of um, the original intent of the, of the policy in terms of affordability. Um, fifth, just acknowledging that, you know, obviously it's a statewide policy and um, guideline, but, you know, there are nuances in quite different contexts in a city versus, you know, in a ring, out of, out of, out of suburban areas as well. Um, sixth, whether or not there's enough focus and attention on external design, um, you know, obviously whether or not it supports innovation, um, you know, alternate forms of housing, just whether or not that, that's covered enough. Um, and then, yeah, just in terms of how we transition from um, current um, current day to uh, moving forward once this, the second amendment is actually made. So as, it's, as I said, JBA has been <coughs> quite heavily involved to date in, uh, in, this, in the SEP and the guidelines, working with the PTA and the department. Um, the formal exhibition has closed, but the department is still taking submissions. Um, it appears that there is some urgency from the department's end in terms of finalising things, so we feel that it's probably trying to get in before, before the state election. SEP 65 really drives a lot of the numbers solutions for, for our clients. So we have, we have clients that come in, to give you a classic example, uh, this project here in Lane Cove, um, the Bay's Pavilion down on Burns Bay Road in Lane Cove. Uh, fronts Burns Bay Road, which is almost a six lane freeway, um, and backs onto Longerville um, River. So you've got beautiful setting, tree lined, almost quite majestic down there. Um, but it unfortunately is on the southern side of the site. So SEP 65 is a real driver to the financial outcomes of projects like this. So there was an original DA on this site for about 220 apartments. And the 220 apartments were really driven by the fact that the original architects to the letter of the law complied with SEP 65. And it generated a building that really didn't stack up financially. And I think what we get to see is, is this situation where a client is really hamstrung to deliver a type of product that they're really needing to deliver to meet the market. So in this situation you had a lot of apartments, 70% facing uh, north or generally northeast um, to get the three hours of sunlight because the council deemed it to be a medium density zone, albeit there's probably something like close to a thousand apartments within a, you know, literally within a sort of a, a two hectare area in this area. There's been a lot of development in the last three or five years there. So the unit sizes were large to comply with SEP 65. Um, obviously cross ventilation meant that there was a lot of corridor space, um, a lot of separations between apartments to get uh, cross flow in, into a lot of those units that they just deemed to, ha to have to have a corner on them. So when we got it, when, when the project came into us and the developer, it was a new developer who, who bought the site off the old developer, sat there and said, look, you know, this just doesn't work from a financial perspective. We started looking at SEP 65 and understanding, trying to understand how, this has got, uh, point one, there we go. So you can see the site down here. So Burns Bay Road is, is to the front and the free, the, sorry, the, um, the water is, is to the south. So when we came up with the scheme 
uh, in the office and, and looked at the apartment sizes and started meeting the sort of the market of 78, 75 to 78 square metre two bedroom units that in effect didn't comply with 65. Um, slotted more apartments into, into the typical floor plan and got two hours of sunlight to the living areas and used the innovative slot model to get cross ventilation into 60% of the units. Um, we presented it to council and they sat there and just said, well, this doesn't comply. And I sat there and I said, but SEP 65 RFDC is a rule of thumb. And the guy just looked at me and said, no, it's not. It's the law. And I think that sort of typifies everything that happens, uh, that's happened in the last probably two to three years with SEP 65, is it's gone from a rule of thumb to, in everybody's mind, it's law. Um, most of you probably know Gabrielle Morris. She does a lot of work with us, and Gabrielle sits on a lot of panels and also um, advises a lot of, uh, does a lot of court work. And she's been advising us on a project. I just want to sort of show you some of the views from the from the southern side. Um, this is, you know, looking south, southwest, and and uh, the reality is that it was it was a lot of fighting with council and threats, and we're going to go to court, and if you go to court, it's only rule of thumb, and all those sort of things that you've got to go through a almost a you know, nine month period of arguing to finally get them to approve um, the solution. So we ended up going from 220 apartments that were an average 88 square metre two bedrooms to 200, almost 280 apartments, an average of 76 square metre two bedroom apartments. So, so you've got a, you know, a much better product for the market that the market's demanding. Um, it becomes more affordable because affordability is based on size times a square metre rate, which the developers use as a way of pricing their apartments. But the solution really was a real, it was excruciatingly long to get through because council deemed SEP 65 and the RFDC as the law and not as a rule of thumb. Um, the other example I want to give you, and I think CORE's are working on this with us at the moment, um, is Avon Road at Pimble. Um, it's a site that is in an amazing parcel of land um, on the North Shore. Um, it's next. It's just up the road from Avon Golf Course, across the road from uh, PLC Pimples Ladies College. Uh, it's a site that's been through the realms uh, for the last probably five, six, seven years, um, and we've been working on it with JBA. And this is an interesting one because it's got a beautiful uh, blue gum high growth forest that runs right through the middle of the site. It's got some amazing um, trees, beautiful blue gums that, that, that basically create a forest of trees. Um, there's a lot of weeds and undergrowth at the moment, it's a spot of the existing site. But one of the biggest issues that we've had is dealing with council. Uh, we're actually in the court process at the moment, and one of the biggest issues that council raised through this court process has been that um, it doesn't matter which, which way you place the buildings, it doesn't matter if all the apartments face north, they're never going to get any sun because of the trees. So here we've got a situation where an environment which is probably one of the most beautiful bush environments from here to Hornsby um, can't be developed because the trees will block out the northern light. And so when you apply the SEP 65 rule, they're not going to get their three hours of sunlight. So probably nothing more ludicrous than, than a situation where you, you're blaming the trees for not getting the light. And we try to get them to understand that, that in this environment, people will be buying apartments or living there because of that the nature of that environment, that the light filtered through and, and being in a bush setting and all those sort of things. But the, 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 um, the literal interpretation of SEP 65 was that the, the leaves of the trees will block out the sun to the north facing units. So what hope did we have? Anyway, we're hopefully working through that court case at the moment and we're hoping to get, um, get an approval in the next month. Um, another example in the, um, in the draft that they, and this is, this is again coming back to the realities of delivering product into the market at an affordable price, which is the thing that we have to deal with every day. Um, here's an example of what someone thinks works really well from a natural, natural ventilation solution for an apartment building. Now, I can tell you now that no one would ever build that building. Um, the facade to floor ratio is of such a number that the cost Multiply that by five, six, seven, eight, two, three, four stories, however many you want. 
that building would just be never would never be buildable at, 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 with that design. And I think the reality is that that um, when the rubber hits the road, as we say, and we need to come up with solutions, the hopefully the draft will take us through to a more performance-based solution rather than a by rule solution. The flip side to that is, and there is a flip side to that, is that we, when we have been able to comply, which, which is in most cases we, we have been going to JRPPs and councils with SEP 65 ticks in all the boxes, it takes it out of the equation. So when we walk in and first thing the panel says to you as a JRPP is, does it comply with SEP 65? And you say yes, and they look at the box and they go, let's move on to something else. The fear that I have is you be careful what you wish for. But if we start make it, making it performance based and we start presenting to panels, design panels of you know, three, four, five, six people, and we start presenting to JRPP where the first question they ask is, do you comply with SEP 65 and the RFDC and other buildings got the rights, have they got the separation as recommended by RFDC? No, but we think this, is, this solves that problem because we've done X and Y. Then it's left up to interpretation. And a panel of three to six designers who are all wanting to have a bite of that apple start getting involved in designing your building. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. So I often say to people, be careful what you wish for. The flip side of giving us a bit more flexibility is that we give them a bit more flexibility. When I say them, I say the consent authorities. So we need to be really careful when, um, when we start you know, talking about performance-based solutions, um, that who is actually going to make that determination that the performance is good enough to match what you would get under SEP 65. So I think that sort of gives you just a brief overview of what we're seeing in the market. Um, I, think, I think the reality is that, um, that unit size, um, unit mix, um, aspects that, that determine the, the, the amount of sellable floor space that you can get out of a building is always going to be an issue with the consent authorities because they perceive developers as trying, you know, greedy, money hungry, not doing good for the community. But that's really what's got us to where we are, in, 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 particularly in the city market, where not enough supply is driving house prices up, and it's been happening for the last five years. And I think what we're seeing now is sort of the end result of this notion that the, that the developers always been treated as the bad guy and not being encouraged or, or partnered with to deliver solutions that delivers the housing stock that we need in Sydney. Just in terms of the two examples you gave, the first two, it seems to me that the problem is not the SEP 65, but with the council's understanding of the application of SEP 65. Yeah, look, um, it, it washes down, so the courts have really grabbed 60, SEP 65 as, as their tool by which they can determine something. So I think there's another, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, but um, what we're seeing is, is, as I mentioned Gabrielle, because she, she, you know, she actually sits in meetings and goes, if you go to court, I don't care what you say about the, the um, building separation, it needs to be 24 metres. If it's 23, the commissioner won't, won't approve it. So, and she understands completely, and you know, she's a big advocate for, for um, it being only considered a, a, um, a rule of thumb, but unfortunately, Everyone's grabbed it as a way of, of deciding whether it's good or bad. Um, and, and the other the, the other example was was the the three hour rule. Like um, in Lane Cove, in that situation, um, we could not convince the council that it was in a high density zone. I mean, there's literally there's a block of 200 here, there's a block of 150 over here, there's a block of 200 next to it. How do you how do you qualify that as medium density? So it wasn't until we found uh, you know, five words in the department's definition of what high density is, and I think it's 140 dwellings, they, the department determines that it's 140 dwellings per hectare or something like that. So you know, grab a hectare, we counted the number of units for like 300, and they said, oh, okay, we'll consider it. So there's no sense of sensibility there. It's just looking for something that, that they can justify to put a tick in the box for you. So unfortunately, that's where we've ended up. Hopefully this Again, be careful <laughs> if it's a good thing, but hopefully this will give us a bit more flexibility to go in and, and argue that, that it's only you know, real thumb and that there's, um, there's other ways of doing it. 
Is there, do you think, Eugene, value uh, in uh, in the SEP um, in terms of getting the architect to the table where there was no architect before, getting the designer to the table to have the debate with the consent authority? Uh, you know, look, the, the issue is it's uh, the architecture is only as good as the architect. I, I could drive you through some suburbs in southwestern Sydney where it breaks my heart. You, you drive through there and, and it's just a lot of really, really poor buildings, they comply with SEP 65. So, uh, you know, maybe in, in most cases it does work, but again, you know, who's, who's letting that stuff through? So. Yeah. I accept your point absolutely about um, being careful uh, what you wish for, uh, because you're quite right, the more subjective the assessment becomes, mm. uh, the more difficult it is to take it off the table at an early point. Um, and of course, uh, when you find yourself in court, um, as most people in this room would know, um, you'll find that the uh, statement of facts and contentions that comes from the council, even uh, if issues have been resolved uh, in negotiations during uh, the inevitable negotiation process of uh, assessment of a DA, you find it comes right back into the statement of facts and contentions mm. and of course uh, you're then in territory where you've got a whole new group of people who are having that debate yep. and costs um, money and time. Money and time, but another um, uh, suite of uh, individuals who are applying their own subjective assessment to um, whether it, whether the outcomes are achieved or not. I'll let you talk about that stuff. Sure. Um, thank you, Eugene, very much. As I say, for um, a, a very practical analysis of um, what's uh, been. Uh, to date, um, uh, the uh, application of the SEP in a practical context um, and, uh, and what may be ahead for us. Um, just before I speak about some of the more recent examples that have been before the Land and Environment Court, um, uh, I was asked to just give some consideration to the transition from um, the current uh, SEP to uh, what's proposed to come. And the answer to that question is, I can't answer the question, because the department hasn't made up its mind as yet. Um, we rang them uh, yesterday to find out what was in their thinking, and the answer was we haven't thought about it as yet. Um, so uh, we'll see what comes, but you can imagine that um, uh, it will be uh, a regime of, um, if your development application's in, um, before the new um, code comes into effect then probably the old will apply so I imagine that might mean that there's a bit of a race uh, for certainty um, because of course councils will um, need some education about it and uh, that will involve the court needing some education about it as well. So I'm going to do a bit of a race through some recent cases just to give you a flavour for the way in which the Land and Environment Court has been applying SEP 65. Um, there isn't uh, a case uh, involving a residential flat building that comes before the court that of course doesn't look at SEP 65 um, and so I could have stood here for many hours but um, these are just uh, a few uh, that popped up in our um, search engine um, relatively early. Um, so the first is uh, Capital Developments and uh, Auburn City Council. Um, so this was uh, an application uh, to the court concerning um, a uh, development application relating to a building that was already halfway out of the ground. Um, it was um, a development application for an additional three storeys on the building and uh, the parties uh, had agreed that the new design um, of the building did um, indeed have some features that improved the internal amenity of the apartments, um, but uh, the court took the view that um, the lack of uh, setbacks for um, what was um, a mixed-use development um, meant that the amending DA was not um, suitable for approval. Um, the important thing here was that um, the applicant um, argued that the uh, locality at Auburn was a rapidly changing environment and um, that uh, what was there today 
was not what the court could consider or should consider what was uh, as to what was going to be there in the foreseeable future. Uh, and the court said, yes, well, that's all very well, um, but with your building um, that doesn't uh, particularly set back uh, the upper storeys, um, we're going to assume that all of those later coming developments around you are going to be SEP 65 compliant and that your building's not going to fit within the character um, of that new locality and um, on that basis um, it was refused. Um, so the takeaway point there is that um, the court will um, assume that later coming development um, is going to be compliant. Um, the next was um, Randall and um, Ashfield Council, um, and this is one of those rather rare beasts these days that uh, was a Section 96.8 modification application. You can only have one of these where your original development application was one that was approved by the court. So you'll recall that um, where you've got a court approval, and you wish to modify it, you've got um, two alternatives available to you. You can either lodge your modification application with the council, or you can ignore that process altogether and lodge it straight with the court. And that's what happened in this instance. Um, so this was um, uh, an approval for um, a, a residential building, and the um, modification that was sought um, concerned the addition not of another story but of a series of bedrooms in the um, essentially in the roof cavity yeah. so um, adding additional bedrooms for each of the upper story apartments and adding dormer windows now this was of, this was um, an appeal that was heard before a commissioner but uh, the parties were so determined about it um, that um, silks were briefed by both parties. And so um, it was a fight to the death uh, over um, a, a question of whether SEP 65 applied at all um, uh, based upon um, an argument about whether this was or wasn't a three-storey building. Um, the court ultimately took the view that it wasn't um, and the SEP didn't apply. Uh, and also uh, there was discussion around um, whether, the, uh, there, whether, whether there was a need um, for uh, a DVS and, um, sorry, just let me check that I've got the right decision here. Um, no, I'm sorry, I've got that wrong. Um, the um, the uh, argument was all about height and um, whether the... Um, modification uh, required a consideration of the whole of the building. Um, regulation 115 was uh, also considered, I'm sorry, in relation to the DVS and um, the uh, court took the view that because a DVS hadn't been required for the original approval and the original building, um, that a DVS was not required for the modification either. Uh, so that one um, passed muster and uh, the court approved the modification. The next one is uh, Joe Toomer and Bankstown Council, um, and this is an application uh, for uh, development consent um, made uh, to the court um, based upon a council refusal, um, and it concerned a boarding house. Uh, it was a, a rectangular site with um, about a 20 metre frontage and a very um, long uh, side boundary and a very steep site. Um, backing onto the railway line. And the question before the court, of course, was um, SEP 65 and whether it applies. Um, the affordable housing uh, SEP, of course, was in contention and um, in large part that was what the developer was um, relying on here. Um, the um, experts um, all agreed and indeed the commissioner agreed um, that SEP 65 and the um, RFDC and indeed the um, affordable housing SEP had all come into being um, before the new model, if you like, of boarding houses had come into existence. And so the court struggled a bit with um, whether to apply SEP 65 and, and, if you like, the extent to which to apply SEP 65. 
So the particular issues um, here were um, in a circumstance where uh, there were three-storey residential flat buildings on either side of this site. Um, and as you might appreciate, a very angry neighbourhood concerned about um, the character of the individuals who might like to come and live in a boarding house, there was a fairly significant amount of objection as well. Um, the court was concerned in considering um, uh, you know, wh whether to apply SIP 65 about particularly cross-ventilation issues and um, the double-loaded corridor um, fr from which um, all of the uh, entry points were to um, each of the rooms in the boarding house. Um, the boarding house uh, comprised uh, a number of common rooms, large common rooms, um, but each of the rooms as well had its own kitchenette um, and many of the rooms um, had balconies. Um, so um, the court took the view that it would um, have to adopt a really subjective analysis about um, the extent to which the um, boarding house um, could or should apply with, um, comply with SEP 65 and that subjective assessment taking all things into account was that it did comply and there was adequate amenity for those who would come to live in the boarding house um, from time to time and that if you applied SEP 65 um, to uh, boarding houses then essentially they would have to be residential flat buildings and that was never the um, in intention and it would be an adverse effect on um, affordability. Um, now there will be some people in the room um, whose interest is spiked um, in the next couple of decisions. Um, the first is um, Botany Council and Marana Developments, um, which um, was uh, a decision of Justice Payne. So uh, it was um, an appeal under Section 56A of the Land and Environment Court Act um, against the decision of a commissioner in approving um, a modification to um, a residential flat building. So it was quite a significant modification um, seeking to increase uh, the number of approved apartments from 76 to a total of 102 units. Um, and from those, for those of you um, in the room who haven't had the uh, pleasure of doing developments in Botany Council, um, the council was fiercely fighting um, for its development control plan to be applied um, and indeed to be determinative in relation to the size of apartments. So it was an appeal by the council um, against the Commissioner's approval of um, the uh, modification of the consent to increase the number of units. Um, it's a very long judgment and I'm not going to take you through um, all the elements because there were many, many grounds of appeal, um, but uh, the important point and the interesting point um, for you here is um, the um, hierarchy, if you like, uh, of SEP 65 versus the Council's LEP and then the Council's DCP. Um, and the court looked at um, SEP 65, um, which, um, and indeed the Environmental Planning Assessment Act, um, which um, prescribes that the SEP will override the provisions or, or prevail um, over the provisions of any other environmental planning instrument. Uh, with which it's inconsistent. The problem here for the council, and indeed for the court, is that the council's DCP is not an environmental planning instrument. So there was nothing that specifically says um, that the inconsistency is to be resolved in that way. However, Justice F uh, Payne found uh, that the commissioner had properly considered the um, council's development control plan in relation to apartment sizes and also that the commissioner um, had made sense of, in a way the council said one couldn't make sense of, um, the provisions of SEP 65 and the RFDC as they relate to apartment f sizes themselves. So the court said if you read the two of those together, in fact they do make sense and oh, by the way, the Commissioner did have regard to the Council's DCP, and so all of the grounds, six grounds uh, of appeal, um, were refused, 
uh, and so the developer proceeds. The next one, you might not be surprised to hear, is a, is a much more recent decision um, and again, it's Botany Council in the court, and again, it's Botany Council endeavouring to um, enforce its apartment size controls, this time not arguing that its DCP should prevail, but flying the SIP 65 flag. So bear with me for a moment, it's a little bit um, unusual, this one. It's a decision of Justice Biscoe um, concerning a contest over a notice of motion to amend the council's points of claim. So the council's uh, coming to the court very late in the piece, uh, wanting to change the rules of engagement in class four proceedings, which are seeking to undo the grant of development consent. Um, and this uh, particular um, approval is one uh, that had been granted under Part 3A, under the transitional provisions of Part 3A, and so it was a, in fact a Part 3A project approval. And one of the amendments that the Council wanted to make to its points of claim in the appeal uh, was to bring in an argument around the application of SIP 65. Um, and a number of the respondents to the appeal um, took the view that the council's points of claim couldn't take the court to SIP 65 because it was a Part 3A project approval and um, SIP 65 doesn't apply to Part 3A. Now, the court um, considered that matter and Justice Biscoe went through um, the relevant provisions um, of the now repealed Part 3A and acknowledged um, that um, Section 75 capital R of the Environmental Planning and Assessment Act as it then was, um, indeed requires the Minister uh, to apply SEPs but not any other EPIs um, when assessing a project application. However, when you look at clause 30 of SEP 65, um, it speaks only of its application in relation to development applications and development consents. And then when you go to the Environmental Planning and Assessment Act and look at the definition of development applications and development consents, you find that it applies only to part so the outcome of um, that little spat, which was all about points of claim and an amendment to points of claim, was a judgment from a judge of the Land and Environment Court to the effect that SEP 65 doesn't apply to Part 3A project approvals. Uh, so that's my little update on um, the way in which the court has um, looked at SEP 65. Um, as you can see, they've struggled um, in a number of um, circumstances where there are some um, um, irregularities, if you like, about the nature of the development that's before the court. Um, and it will be indeed interesting to see um, how the court subjectively assesses um, performance outcomes um, if the new uh, controls are, uh, find their way into being in the form that they are at the present time.